What's up guys, welcome back to Superdorf vs. The World. In today's episode, we have Brian Cusco arguing that blood pythons are in fact better than Superdorfs. Also, side note, this was filmed at Tinley, so the audio kind of sucks, but Brian is amazing and what he has to say is top quality information. So without further ado, your man Brian. Although I'm not the authority on blood python whatsoever, okay. I decided to choose that as a species I well. You already had people picked out for ball pythons, so. So our first category is a wow factor. I mean, blood pythons get a 10, dude. Like, biased or not, they're just these big, fat looking snakes. Like somebody that doesn't know snakes sees a blood python, they're like, how is that snake so fat? I mean, it's like got the girth of a Burmese python in the length of a ball python. It's just incredible when you see them. I mean, they get the 10 on the wow. It's just like, wow, how is that snake so incredibly fat? Big old freaking meat sausage of a snake. And then the name too. Like when you're blood. looking at like, you, you, there's like, what is that snake? You're like, this is a blood python. Like blood python, it's just, it's just got wow all Makes over sense. it. All right, so you give that 10 out of 10 a lot. 100%. All right, diversity. There's a variety of blood pythons. Do we get a lot of color variety, pattern variety? I would be humble in the fact that I would definitely not give it a 10 because uh, comparatively to like say something like ball pythons that are extremely polymorphic and have just endless amounts of morphs and variety i would probably have to bring them down to something more realistic like a like a seven because there is variety there are morphs you got t negative you got t positive you got matrix you got golden eye you got it's definitely not going below five so it's, it's at the seven marker because there is variety but just compared to something like i said as, as broad as ball pythons or even reticulated pythons um, there are not as many morphs to play with yeah you give that one a, a seven, seven. Attainability, price, population, rarity. If you live in the United States, they're fairly attainable. There are more and more people working with them. I myself have produced a, a couple clutches of uh, blood pythons, and um, I don't know if that holds true throughout the rest of the world. Like Australia, probably hard come by on one of those. Definitely in the United States, they're they're fairly available. It, it's. The I'd give them an, I'd the give an eight. Brian? I'd give them an eight because they're pretty available. Our next category is personality. So blood pythons are one of the most sedentary species of snake out there. They pride themselves, I would say, if blood python was capable of having pride, they would pride themselves on how very little they defecate, which is something that's born of a species that doesn't move much. They stay in one spot, and that's why they sometimes go a whole year without actually relieving themselves, because they don't want to literally blow up their spot where they've been sitting for a long time, waiting for prey to come along. So. Personality-wise, it's not like definitely not like Superdorf, definitely not like a scrub python, definitely not one of these more active species that's always cruising around. It's generally going to be sitting in one spot. But they do have a personality, don't get me wrong, but you have to look very deep for it. If you look in, deep into their eye, there's, you can see they're paying very close attention to everything happening around them. Okay. Probably, yeah. like, probably like a five deep. Like, I'm probably going to give this one a five. What would you rate the support industries? For example, is there a market built around the species that makes it easier to care for, caging supplies, feeding? Well, since blood pythons are successfully kept very much like ball pythons, then I'd say there's a pretty large support out there as far as caging and care. Like the care is almost the same. You just keep them a little bit cooler. There are not as many people as ball python breeders out there, but the, but the quality of the people within the blood python keeping and breeder, breeding community there are people that just like know so much about their species that the support is strong. So I'm gonna put that at a, at a nine. Interactivity. Do they want that interaction with humans or are they better left alone? So they, don't, they don't necessarily want to hang out with you. But that could be said of all snake species, that could be said of all species, period. They're like humans, no thanks. This goes back to the uh, personality thing where they look at you they do pay very close attention to what you're doing, so they are interested in what you're doing. Like they, if you if you know blood pythons, you know that they are being are very aware of what's happening. Do they want you to come pick them up and bring you along for that journey? Probably not. And then when you do hold them, they they just kind of sit there and they they definitely would rather you put them down most often. The, 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 there are exceptions. I don't want to give them a bad score. We came here to be impartial, Brian. Did we? I thought we came here to like sell the species. There's a bonus category for that. Yeah, we'll go with the three. Final score is three. Uh, I hate it. I'm too honest about this stuff. I should be. I should learn how to lie more. Uh, 
It would hurt you too much. Next category is ease of care. They get a 10. Not even gonna, no, they get a 10. They're so easy to care for. So easy. You just give them what you give any other ectothermic creature, as long as they've got their little warm spot, which I say warm because you don't want them to be too hot. They also happen to defecate maybe like once a year sometimes, which if you don't like cleaning up after your animals, well, the blood python, again, 10. Ease of care is 10. Durability. How hard is it to accidentally kill them, basically? Oh, dude, they're going to, they're, they're highly durable. Highly durable. If you accidentally stepped on it, or like dropped it or did something horrible that you shouldn't be doing with the animal, animal that you're caring for, it would survive it. If you forgot to feed it for a year, it would survive. Durability gets a 10. Our next category is risk. I have been bitten by a baby blood python and the teeth did not break skin. Now, now let's, let's take into account that any individual snake could be dangerous to a human. If you spend any amount of time with a blood python, they're intelligent enough to learn that it's not a dangerous time for them to be held and they won't try to bite you. When they're juveniles, it's a little bit different, but that's the same for a lot of snakes. They're, they're gonna be trying to bite at you when they're babies and they're defensive. But like I said, I once stuck my hand into a whole tub of like 20 baby blood pythons that are all striking me because they're all scared. And they literally, there was literally no blood whatsoever. And if you happen to get smacked by an adult blood python, yeah, that would hurt. But they're gonna let you know that that that's coming. They're not gonna just like strike you out of the blue. Like you're gonna be able to tell this, this is a snake that wants to be left alone. So, right but if you did get hit, if you did get hit, we'll give it an eight. Cause if you did get hit by an adult, they s literally put their entire body into it. All right, we have one more category. It's a bonus category. You could rate them on your experience of how has your experience been? Keeping. Oh, that could oh. Be your, that could be your last category. Okay. How's your experience of keeping them? So, I'll give that a 10 because the snake that I got was a baby, the first, my first blood python, little baby, very defensive, striking at everything. I couldn't get the camera anywhere near close without a strike. But then if you go in from behind and just kind of scoop them up very gently and slowly, they'll just sit in your hand and you could stick your finger up there to their, under their chin and start giving them little pets. And they're like, something's touching me, not necessarily what I want to be touched, but there's nothing I can do about it and it's not hurting me. And they learned so quickly that they do not need to be defensive with you. I have pictures of my three-year-old son holding this snake a couple of months after I worked with it, you know, and it was no longer striking and just hung out there with him and grew into this big, beautiful beast. And they also, as you're raising them, they, they get more beautiful with age, which is not something that's true of most snake species or humans. Or humans. Most start out, you know, kind of like, like, oh, super cute and like good looking. And then they kind of grow into these uglier adults. You know, to use the word ugly. Blood pythons don't do that. They get more and more beautiful as they age. They grow into their beauty. They grow into their size. And, and it's a nice, big, impressive animal that isn't too heavy to hold. In fact, I had Hillary um, holding all of my reticulated pythons recently and showing them off. And then she went to hold the blood python. She's like, oh, this is so light, but still so girthy and impressive. Yeah, thick. My son picked his first species to be a blood python to keep. This is an innocent child with zero biases towards any species because of sales or this or that and he chose a blood python as his very first species to keep as his own snake and so that's saying something for them and, and it was that balance of what I appreciate about them too is there's a slight challenge at the beginning but you work with them and you got this beautiful animal that is easy to work with and you hardly have to clean up after it, uh, it it's a 10. Somehow, blood pythons beat super dwarfs in a very, very close half point lead. We may have lost the battle, but we have not lost the war. Go ahead and check out this video right here to see us rank the baseline score that we've given super dwarfs to 79.5. Go ahead and watch this video to figure out how we got that score. Thank you very much for being here, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Also, Merry 2022, I think. I don't remember when this video goes out, but good luck. Hopefully see you in the future, but goodbye. Enjoy the video.